Right, but let's get straight to the last street where markets saw a sharp recovery in the last hour to end with slim losses. Now, after threatening to breach the 10,600 mark in trade today, the Nifty spiked to recoup those losses and end above the 10,650 mark. The Sensex uh, shed about 65 points, though. Among the broader markets, uh, banks ended uh, with cuts of about three tenths of a percent after a weak performance over the last few days. Mid caps have outperformed to end with gains of three tenths of a percent. An investigative news portal, Cobra Post, has levelled allegations against housing finance company DHFL. The stock tumbled over 8% after Cobra Post accused the company's promoters of siphoning off funds to the tune of 31,000 crore rupees via shell companies. The Cobra Post also went on to accuse uh, DHFL of uh, disbursing loans to companies in Gujarat and Karnataka just before assembly elections in both those states. Rituparna Bhaiya is here with all the details from there. Uh, Ritu, can you take us through the uh, charges made by Cobra Post against uh, the, uh, DHFL? These allegations uh, which uh, Cobra Post is making is through an investigative report which they have done. Uh, they claim that uh, an internal investigation which they have been carrying out for a couple of months uh, have uh, led to uh, these figures. For example, uh, they have said that 31,000 uh, crores uh, uh, were siphoned off, allegedly siphoned off by DHFL uh, you know, promoters. Uh, uh, this was basically done through giving uh, of secured loans to shell companies uh, uh, for slum development and then again you know giving of loans to another web of uh, 45 uh, uh, companies which are according to cobra post uh, uh, report uh, are again uh, shell companies uh, the allegations also talk about how loans were given to companies in gujarat and karnataka uh, 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 just before uh, the uh, respective state elections in these states, uh, uh, allegations are, have also been made by Cobra Post uh, regarding insider trading and trading and SESD violation. Uh, so net net, what uh, uh, the Cobra Post report uh, says is that uh, you know a web of uh, shell companies uh, were created allegedly by DHFL uh, uh, promoters. For example, you know the report says that they identified. Specifically, for example, 45 companies out of which uh, 34 companies had direct interest uh, with the promoters of uh, DHFL. Uh, or, or these 45 companies, for example, according to DHF, uh, according to the Cobra Post report, got uh, uh, loans in excess of 14,282 crores, and these companies did not have any business or income, according to the investigation done by Cobra Post. Uh, uh, last but not the least, uh, uh, the 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 uh, the. Uh, Portal also claims that once this money was sent to those uh, shell companies, uh, then uh, uh, those shell, shell companies transferred that money to other entities which had uh, links to the promoters of uh, DHFL and that money was then used uh, uh, for creation of personal asset. Uh, of course, uh, as I said before, uh, this, these are allegations made by uh, the investigative portal Cobra Post uh, in a report and on which they have done a press conference uh, just a few moments back. With that, it's back to you. Right, uh, Rutupanda, many thanks for joining us with all the details from there. Let's also get you some stock-specific action from Jet Airways. Uh, so that stock remained in focus. That on the back of news that the airline is considering various funding options as part of its turnaround plan. The company is expected to seek shareholders' nod for its proposals at an extraordinary general meeting on the 21st of February. Ritu Singh is here with all the details from there. Ritu, uh, what are the key elements of the company's revival plan uh, going forward? That's why Jet Airways informed exchanges yesterday that it was working or considering various funding options as part of the turnaround plan which involved converting wholly or partially its debt into equity or convertible instruments or other securities. For, to this effect, it is going to hold an extraordinary general meeting or EGM on the 21st of February to seek shareholder nod, one, uh, to expand the capital base or increase the share capital almost 11 folds from 200 crore rupees to 2,200 crore rupees. This it proposes to do by issuing fresh 50 crore equity shares and 150 crore preferential shares. Uh, it will also seek shareholder nod to convert part or whole of the debt into equity or convertible instruments or securities and also future loans into uh, these instruments if required at a later point of time. Uh, it has also proposed, importantly, to modify the Articles of Association uh, of Jet Airways to ensure that lenders can now have the right to nominate directors on the board of the bank. Remember, uh, as we have been reporting, this is something that the bankers have been discussing. They may propose
propose one or two new board members, uh, which could be part of uh, you know the lenders consortium as well, uh, to the board of Jet Airways as part of the restructuring or turnaround. Uh, it'll also seek to authorize the board to negotiate and finalize the terms uh, with the lenders to issue fresh loans from time to time and allow them to convert them into equity at a future point of time uh, if needed. Then uh, clearly, you know, uh, all this points to the fact that you know a deal, uh, you know, is clearly in the works and uh, Jet is working towards that. Uh, you know, with the share capital also expanding, it's possible we'd see uh, both Naresh Goel, who currently holds 21%, and Etihad Airways, that owns 24%, both of their stakeholding also reducing, uh, you know, as part of this overall restructuring plan. Right, Ritu, many thanks for bringing us all the details from there. And let's also shift focus to earnings coming in today. So housing finance major HDFC has reported a year-on-year -year drop of over 60% in its net profit. However, despite the decline, third quarter profit at 2,100 crore rupees has topped estimates. Uh, HDFC's net interest income at around 3,200 crores is also above expectations. Now, the company's asset quality has witnessed a marginal deterioration during the quarter as well. And uh, on to banks, where Axis Bank has reported a strong set of earnings for the third quarter on a quarterly basis. So the net profit more than doubled, while uh, net interest income saw an 18% growth. The bank's asset quality has seen an improvement as well of about 20 basis points on both the gross as well as the net level. So good performance there by Axis Bank. Now the big earnings from the IT space, where HCL Tech has posted a strong revenue performance in the third quarter. So net profit, uh, aided by lower taxes, managed to beat estimates. Margins at over 19%, meanwhile, met the street view. Uh, the company has also maintained its FY19 constant currency uh, revenue guidance at 9.5%. So overall, a good picture there as well. Now, just two days to go before the budget and startups have once again uh, made a fresh plea to Interim Finance Minister Piyush Goel as well as Commerce Minister Suresh Prabhu on the angel tax exemption. Now, startups say that the angel tax continues to be a sticky issue even after DIPP's clarification issued on the 16th of January. Timzi Jaipuri is here with all the details from there. Uh, Timzi, what are startups seeking from the government this time? Well, sources told CNBC TV18 that startups have made a fresh plea to Piyush Goyal and Suresh Prabhu on the angel tax issue, where startups have written to Piyush Goyal and Suresh Prabhu saying that the angel tax continues to be a sticky issue and the January 16 circular brought in by DIPP doesn't give the immunity that was sought by startups. Startups in their fresh submission to DIPP has sought changes in the January 16 circular saying that they need a blanket exemption from Section 56 of the IT Act for DIPP Level 1 record recognize startups. However, in the meanwhile, startups say that they are willing to submit additional documents for the last two years, including audited financial reports, monthly expenses, employee details, TDS returns, GST returns, etc., to suffice the requirements that uh, DIPP and CBDT need. Remember, DIPP is likely to hold a roundtable with startups on February 4th, where startup industry representatives are likely to be present, CBDT officials and revenue secretary are also likely to attend. It. So let's see what Piyush Goyal does, whether the solution will come from the new person who's at the helm of finance ministry right now, or whether this, this issue continues to remain a <laughs> sticky wicket for startups. Back to you. Right, Timzi, absolutely. So there you have it, uh, startups seeking some uh, relief on that uh, sticky start uh, angel tax issue. Uh, in fact, uh, let's move on to the other big story that we're tracking. So yesterday, Rahul Gandhi announced a minimum income guarantee for the poor who voted to power. With the government working on an agri-relief package of its own, many believe that Rahul Gandhi's move was a preemptive strike. The buzz in the corridors of power is that the cabinet could clear agri-relief measures soon. Now, the government sources are telling us that the Agriculture Ministry has sent several proposals to the Prime Minister's office. In fact, uh, let's go across to Parikshit, who's standing by with all the details from there. Parikshit, what are you picking up? Well, it has been an inter-ministerial exercise. Several ministries, especially the Agri-Ministry, has been sending data to the Prime Minister's office for several weeks now. A lot of data about uh, small and marginal farmers, size of land holdings, fields, number of farmers, size of families has been sent to the Prime Minister's office in the last uh, two to three weeks. We also believe that a set of proposals are before the Prime Minister's office. This has been prepared by the Niti Aayog, by uh, the Agri-Ministry as well. This includes an income support scheme uh, on the lines of the Raitu Bandhu scheme. We have heard from various government sources that a universal basic income may not be possible because of the huge cost involved but uh, they could have uh, an income support scheme some sort of a direct transfer so that uh, the farmer has uh, cash in hand so the focus of the government is to provide additional income to the farmers reduce input costs also uh, 
probably in, uh, make sure that the Fasal Bhima Yojana is uh, better implemented as well. So these are the kind of proposals that are there before the Prime Minister's office and uh, they only need to uh, get a political call. All that remains now is a political call to be taken at the highest level, at the level of the Prime Minister and that could happen in the Cabinet very soon. Warring promoters of Yes Bank, Rana Kapoor and Madhu Kapoor could be burying the hatchet. In a press release, Yes Bank has announced that both of them have decided to appoint one director each on the bank's board. Lata is here with all the details from there. Uh, Lata, what are you picking up? Uh, well, uh, this is important in the sense that uh, uh, for, the, for the longest time, the two groups didn't see eye to eye. The history of the two is, is very interesting. Uh, Madhu Kapoor, uh, uh, who is the widow of Ashok Kapoor, Rana Kapoor's brother, with whom he had started the, uh, the bank, uh, was miffed that she was not being consulted in the various uh, board appointments. Uh, but as promoter, the two were presented together, the shares of both uh, uh, entities, that is the Madhu Kapoor uh, uh, set of uh, shares and uh, the Rana Kapoor and related uh, uh, parties' shares. She had even insisted that her daughter Shagun be appointed to the board about four or five years back and the board had not uh, permitted it, saying that uh, she was not otherwise qualified. Since then, uh, there was a lot of uh, tiff between the two. And uh, in uh, just a few uh, months back when it, uh, uh, Rajat Monga was getting appointed as the executive director and it required the board approval, then uh, you know you required approval of uh, uh, Madhu Kapoor as well. So at that time, there was uh, peace meetings between uh, the two groups. But now it looks like they have buried the hatchet because each of them have uh, appointed one director each. So it looks like a peace. It looks like they have buried the hatchet. Uh, uh, but uh, that's, that's we all we have is that press release. Uh, Mr. Jain Gupta, a former ED of SEBI and a very close watcher, he's uh, owner of a, a proxy investor firm, uh, uh, Stakeholder Empowerment Services, SES. Uh, he's with us. Uh, Mr. Gupta, what do you make of this news? Each of them have uh, uh, appointed one director each, signaling thereby a truce between them. Uh, what does, how do you uh, interpret this development? Lata, there is a lot of difference between saying each one of us will appoint a director or together we will appoint two directors. Okay. Now the issue is if together two people appoint two directors, mm. there is supposed to be some sort of unity in the board. Mm -hmm. Now if two people separately deciding on two individuals, mm. then the animosity which was there continues may continue on the board also okay so therefore we do not know whether the truth is truth in the real sense mm. or in the sense only for having one representative each on the board okay if it is if i'll it just is, read it out to you sir you tell me how you would interpret it uh, uh, two promoter groups one representative director each on yes bank board that's the headline uh, yes, Bank, wide its release dated November 20th, has had stated that efforts. Okay, one minute. That efforts were underway for mutual resolution and truce between Mr. Rana Kapoor Group and Ms. Madhu Kapoor and family, the two co-promoter groups of the bank. Recently, select senior board of directors of the bank had also interacted with Ms. Madhu Kapoor and family. Madhu Kapoor Group and Rana Kapoor Group have agreed to nominate one representative director each on the bank's board. Subject to the completion of necessary documentation, the two new appointed directors will be announced at the next scheduled board meeting. Uh, in April 2019. This is intended to ensure better coordination and support by the two promoter groups with the new MD and CEO and the board of directors. Uh, the interim arrangement, the other rec uh, announcement, the board today approved and recommended to the RBI for its approval a senior board director for temporarily holding the office as board director on interim special uh, duty till such time as R Ravneet Gill assumes office in March 2019. Okay, actually, uh, it doesn't indicate uh, that the two have together appointed two people, it does look that the two have separately appointed one representative each. That seems to be the reading. How did you interpret it, sir? No, I'm saying, Nata, the issue is that had it been a, not a history of fighting between the two groups, then if a message is coming that I will appoint one director, you will appoint one director, there is nothing to be reading read in between. But when there is a history of animosity between two people, then unless until the truth is in the real sense, the thing may continue on the board. I'm not saying it will continue, but I'm saying if 
it was that two people will appoint two directors yeah. nothing nothing wrong with it That's but two people appointing two separate directors probably i will i am be guided by what madhu kapoor says and okay. you will be guided what rana kapoor says so okay. that is a, still one difficult thing that's a very interesting on, interpretation and on the other way mm. i would say i have been always against a shareholder nominating a director because it has to be it is a board which let the majority at, mm, appoint all the directors yeah. and especially in a place like bank yeah. so, so that is where my interpretation and my Okay. Well, to be fair, the majority is still uh, independent board members and not uh, yeah. selected by the promoter group. Uh, to yeah. that extent, perhaps uh, uh, independence will prevail yeah. in the board. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Gupta, we will have to end this conversation because Axis Bank uh, press conference is about to start. But just a word: if I were Ravneet Gill, I will be very happy with this uh, situation because uh, at least uh, the promoters will not gang up against me. Right. Uh, it's an independent board, and that's Amitabh Chaudhary. uh the new uh, md and ceo of axis bank presenting the first set of numbers uh, the th third quarter numbers position and to outline the strategic focus of the organization going forward i'm glad to share with you and i think we have circulated a few slides on our, th our where our thinking on our strategy is at this moment we have uploaded a presentation uh, on our website earlier today and which we have attempted to articulate at a very broad and macro level Uh, the strategy access bank would like to execute over the next few years <clears throat> our strategy for the next 3 years would pivot around delivery of three important vectors growth profitability and sustainability let me start with growth india continues to be the fastest growing large economy and has been a leading global growth leading global growth over the last couple of years the financial sector in our country has been both a key beneficiary and an important enabler of this growth thus growing itself at a fairly brisk pace despite the asset quality challenges that the sector has faced the competitive and market share dynamics of the industry at present continue to favor nimble well capitalized digital ready private banks i believe access bank is that franchise and is uniquely positioned to leverage this opportunity and gain and regain the past momentum on growth and profitability quickly our market share is still only 4% on deposits and 4.7% on loans the developments in the market present us with a unique opportunity and a tremendous opportunity to improve upon these numbers in short order our focus over the next few years on growth vector would be to improve deposit growth materially to fund our strong loan growth aspirations establish digital leadership in payments and digital space and capabilities and to materially scale up our subsidiaries the second important vector for our strategy is profitability we would continue to focus on growing our core operating profitability uh, striving to enhance both margins and fee incomes we intend to make all significant portfolio mix choices based on assessment of risk adjusted return on capital which is rerock we intend to drive relentlessly our focus on improving our cost efficiency also and of course most important of all we intend to reduce the bank's credit costs materially from where it is today these moves we believe have sufficient potential to bring us back to return ratios that our stakeholders have been used to in the past the third vector for our strategy is sustainability while delivery of growth and profitability is really important we intend to focus just as much on the sustainability front and our on our so that our efforts and outcomes reflect what we are trying to do on growth and profitability side for this we are investing in three major areas we are strengthening our core bd b technology analytics operations or processes we are investing on risk management and architecture and finally we are reorienting the organization structure and building a bench of senior talent to deliver continued excellence the idea is to execute in a rigorous and disciplined manner across organization all the time in the strategy slides there is a slide on the structure which is and the n minus ones also which is kind of quite well represented an important element in building a sustainable franchise is to embed conservatism in our internal policies and practices with that in mind i have been working with the team to identify areas of balance sheet that might require further strengthening an early step i have taken is to review our corporate portfolio with the team starting with the largest accounts to assess if there are signs of stress in these accounts that we need to be aware of my initial review suggests 
that most of the accounts that are under any stress are indeed tagged as BB in our system. As Jaram will share with you, all the slippages in this quarter, 98% of the slippages in this quarter are coming from BBB or the BB uh, tagged accounts. Our goal at Access Bank is to deliver 18% ROE on a sustainable basis by focusing on these three vectors, growth, profitability, and sustainability across the Access franchise. I'm confident that we'll get there sooner rather than later, and I'm happy to be, be sitting here and lead the organization on that journey. With that, let me hand over to Jeram to take you through the bank's financial performance in this quarter. Jeram. Thank you very much, Amitabh. After that, conversation on the medium-term strategy trajectory of the bank. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the third quarter. There are uh, six points that I'd like to draw your attention to with respect to the third quarter. Uh, starting with profitability, clearly the big story in this quarter has been the fact that profitability metrics have improved substantially. Uh, profits are up 131% uh, to 1,681 crores on a YOY basis. Operating profits are up 43% YOY. Uh, net interest uh, income, is up 18% YOY, some of the strongest net interest income we have seen. Uh, by the way, on the profit after taxes of uh, 1,681 crores, that is the strongest profit number that we have had in the last 11 quarters. Um, so clearly making some good progress on that front. Uh, net interest margin is up as well, up from 3.36 in the second quarter uh, at uh, 3.47 uh, in this quarter. Fees uh, has grown in the <coughs> mid to high teens, about 16% uh, YOY. Uh, led by retail, which uh, grew 22% uh, in terms of its fee income. So that's the big profit story. The second big story this quarter has been on asset quality, where, as we have been pointing out, there is a continued moderation, and that story has uh, played through in this quarter as well. Our uh, gross and net NPA ratios have both declined. Uh, the gross has declined to 5.75% from 596 and the net has declined to 2.36% from 2.54%. In terms of new NPA formation, uh, gross slippages for the quarter were 3,700 crores. And uh, as Amitabh alluded to earlier, 98% of all the new NPA formation in the corporate book happened from the already disclosed double B and below book. This book, on an outstanding basis, has declined by 14% on a quarter on quarter basis, from roughly 8,800 crores to now 7,645 crores. So the outstanding book of stressed loans continues to fall and substantial. Recoveries and upgrades during the quarter were 2,620 crores. The third big theme in this quarter was provision coverage. We spent a lot of uh, effort and energy and, uh, and, and PNL to uh, continue to beef up the provision coverage. You see that the provision coverage ratio of the bank has increased from 73% uh, last quarter to 75% this quarter. Also, the bank has made, in addition to the regular provisions that are required by regulatory norms, we have uh, gone ahead and made some additional contingent provisions of 600 crores. Right, so there you have it, uh, Axis Bank unveiling a three-pronged strategy, namely uh, based on three vectors, which will be growth, profitability, and sustainability going forward. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Reporters Diary. Many thanks for watching, but do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18.